I want to tell you how I first met Dr. Judy, because you're about to meet a legendary figure. And the legend is based on fact, <laughs> <laughs> not fiction. Yeah. I went to the what's now the National Communication Association, and I, before I met Dr. Judy, I went to Preservation Hall, the birthplace of jazz. Uh, it's an American art form, and I saw this stunning woman with a blonde bun on top of her head, really grooving on the jazz. And I thought, what fascinating woman. And I was as mesmerized by her as I was by the Preservation Hall group, who were spectacular. Then imagine my astonishment. The next day at, NC at then SCA, where I looked across the sea of mostly men wearing tweedy coats and narrow dark ties and all holding briefcases, there was a woman in the sea of men. And she had this blonde bun. But it, she changed her outfit, of course, to this stunning purple pantsuit. And I thought, I don't care what university she's from. I don't care what my mentor said about the universities I was interviewing with. I would do those, but I would also interview with this person. I had to find out who she was. And I found out it was Dr. Agnes Duty. And what impressed me, she was the only person who interviewed me who asked me any questions about teaching and learning, who cared about students and what I thought about education in the classroom and outside the classroom and what I cared about helping students to achieve to pursue their dreams. She was wearing that purple so today an homage to Dr. <laughs> 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 I see Dr. Lisberger was also well there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's it's a pleasure on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences and if you haven't been there yet and hopefully you've been there many times you must visit the Agnes Street Duty Auditorium in Swan Hall, where there are these four spectacular shadow boxes of memorabilia, text and image, and fabulous earrings, uh, purple, <laughs> in homage to Dr. Judy. And every year when I meet freshmen and associate deans, Maura Papin Eaton can testify to this, I talk to the incoming parents of the class about Dr. Judy and how she symbolizes our student-centered research university. So it's really an honor and pleasure to greet my dear friend and colleague. But I'm turning it over for the proper introduction <laughs> to Dr. Steve Wood. No one has ever accused me of being proper before. <laughs> I certainly have Particularly a dean. <laughs> I have not known Agnes that long, only 33 years. Uh, Agnes came to the university in 1958, I believe. Right. Uh, undergraduate at Emerson, graduate at uh, Pitt. I mean, uh, oh, Pennsylvania. Penn State, My son, man. Yeah. My son's at Pitt. Okay. Penn State. Um, and there's some grand and glorious stories that I'm not at liberty to share with you from those days. Um, I was privileged to host uh, Agnes's retirement about 12 years ago, where we raised over $150,000. She had former students come from Japan, Europe, coast to coast in the United States. It was a stunning event. And I wanted to get a special suit for the day. <laughs> and I was teaching one night a week up in Providence, and I passed this men's store and they had this purple zoot suit in the window. And I asked my wife, I said, I gotta get the purple zoot suit. She said, no. No, you will not do that. And Agnes and I had lunch and I recounted that story. And behind my back, she went out and walked the <laughs> So I thought, what's a purple zoot suit without a purple pin pad? So I went online and typed in pin pad and found the nearest distributor was in Providence. <laughs> I still have the suit. I have no idea what I'll do with it. I'll probably get the theater department. Um, Agnes, to say she is legendary, is understated. The stories I know, she won't have time to share with you today. But I'll be happy to share with them privately, anytime. Okay? Uh, I count her as my friend. Uh, I count her as uh, a person I bumped into for the first time this weekend. And I, and I said, gee, do you know Dr. Duty? He's an electrical engineer up in Boston. He said, know her? I had her for speech in 1972. <laughs> okay. 
She was really tough, but you learn a lot. And of course, her nickname at that point was General Pat. <laughs> One, a nickname she earned, by the way. And so there's a lot here, but she asked me what she should talk about today, and I said, are you kidding? Tell us how you got here. It is such an incredible journey. And so I turn it over to Dr. Agnes Duty to give us her journey and join me in welcoming her. Thank you, sir. In 1954, I was engaged to a tall, handsome, wonderful engineer. We were both at Penn State. And I was in doing, starting my graduate work, and he was ahead of me for two years. And he graduated. He said, uh, come on, let's get married, and we'll move to Pittsburgh. And I said, no, no, no. I, I want to finish my graduate work. I want to get a PhD. And he said, no woman gets a PhD. I said, this one's going to. And we broke up. It was sad, but uh, <laughs> I decided to get my PhD. And I worked hard for it at uh, campus. I did an exciting uh, study on Prime Minister Nehru's non-alignment policy and how he spoke to create that block. It was very, very exciting. And I put a lot of work into it. And so then he had the defense of your dissertation. And Dr. Elton Carter, one of my professors, the first question he asked me was, Miss Duty, haven't we as a faculty wasted a great deal of time educating you if you get married this summer? And I said, I'll answer that question only if you ask it of every man who goes through this program. And we went head to head, and my advisor's kicking me under the table, easy girl, <laughs> easy girl. And so he uh, calmed me down, and I got through the defense of my dissertation and uh, ended up here at URI. I took the job uh, sight unseen, and when I came here, I was startled because I came from Penn State, where the football stadium seats 105,000. And I said, where's the football stadium? And they said, I said you got to be kidding. I just couldn't believe that what I had done. Then I, uh, at Penn State, because the campus was so big, I had a bike to get around, you know, cause, and so I had my bike here. And I started biking on campus. I was here about two weeks, and Dean Browning, the Dean of Arts and Science, wanted to see me. And I go, oh. and I went in, and he said, uh, and I thought, well, what's this all about? Uh, Miss Duty, I've seen you bicycling on campus. Others have seen you bicycling on campus. Do you think it's dignified for a lady member of our faculty to be bicycling on campus? Why, well, Dean Browning, I never thought my dignity be tested on a bicycle seat. <laughs> and uh, I just brought this picture to show you. You can start circulating it around. I rode my bicycle every single day into November, and I always went by his office window. Hello, Dean Browning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he uh, got used to it. He had no choice. <laughs> then I had another summons from him in the following summer. Miss Duty, said Dean Browning, I understand you've been seen wearing a sleeveless blouse in class. Do you think that's proper for a lady member of our faculty to be wearing a sleeveless blouse in campus? Dean Browning, I didn't know this was the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> and I went out and bought five more sleeveless blouses <laughs> every single day on my bike and my sleeveless blouse. <laughs> I'll have to give uh, Dean Browning a certain amount of credit. Um, he passed away a few years later, and his daughter called me. And she said, um, we would like you to give the eulogy at my father's funeral. And I said, are, are you sure? She said, yes. You don't know that she said, but my father loved you. <laughs> <laughs> I was unable to give the eulogy because it was um, 
to uh, soon after my uh, first husband, Arthur, died, and I just wasn't afraid I could handle it. And then uh, I'd been here seven years, and uh, I was denied tenure. And that's because uh, the chair of the department, we were speech and theater. We didn't get along. I was constantly complaining about the low standards in the department. I thought we needed to do a lot. And all he cared about was the theater, frankly. He, he almost did. He didn't care if the faculty who were teaching um, the theater courses, uh, if, if they were directing a play, he didn't care if they didn't meet their classes. So I started to protest that. And so I was denied tenure. And that led to a hearing with the dean. And uh, Bob Will is going after me, and he said, well, and the final thing is, she's not a member of the team. And the dean said to me, well, you've heard the charge. Uh, what's your reaction? I said, well, here, he and I agree. I'm not a member of his team because I've never played on a second-rate team in my life. <laughs> and boom, and that exploded. So the dean <laughs> didn't dare look me straight in the eye, but <laughs> they suspended the decision for a, uh, a year. And instead of the, our dean making the decision, he gave it to the council of deans. For those of you who don't know the structure, the, the dean of each college, I don't know if it still persists, but the dean of each college, is that right, Winnie? He has a council of deans. So they gave the tenure issue to the council of deans. and. Um, I was very moved. I got a unanimous decision from the Council of Deans. So Will was stuck with me. And I thought, aha, now. So one day I went and I said, you know, we're not getting along, Bob. This really doesn't make sense. Every time the budget comes up, you fight for theater, I fight for the debate team, speech. And I said, why don't we split the department? And we'll each have our own budget. And we'll make out like that. I said, that's a marvelous idea. That's a marvelous idea. He was just thrilled. And he didn't, he pushed it through. He didn't have a committee uh, sit on it. You know, he went to the dean, agreed it was a wonderful idea. And it was just hilarious. So I split, and there were five my male colleagues and myself. And they had a meeting. We'll decide who's going to be the chair of the new department. And Al Grisabian, who was just a terrific guy, said, well, um, you know, the devil we know is better than the one we don't know. Let's have Agnes chair. So, <laughs> so that was the way I was elected chair of the department. <laughs> and then in um, 1978, I was the first woman to serve on the athletic council. And the uh, director of the athletic program was, the only thing he cared about was athletics. And the year, that was 1978, and that was the year that they uh, passed legislation so that the budgets were equal for men and women. Title what, yeah, Title IX, thanks. I, I had the date, but I think, yeah, Title IX. So I was on the Athletic Council, the only woman there. And I said to the, you know, Title IX to the, uh, the director, and he said, I don't care what the hell that's about. We're going to go on as we plan. And the men all agree, but one of the men, was a URI graduate, an athlete, and he had five daughters. So finally, I thought, aha. So I said, um, have you ever thought about what it's like? Let's say you have a daughter who's playing volleyball in the afternoon, and then she has to take off her uniform, and one of the gals playing basketball that evening has to wear that uniform. So you're saying to me, it's OK if your daughter puts on another gal's dirty uniform, including her pants. I can't believe that would happen. I said, what do you think's happening? That's the way we got money for women's <laughs> athletics. It had to do with dirty underwear. It was just amazing. <laughs> Whatever call you, whatever door you can open, you do it. So that was really amazing. And then I had a very nice thing happen to me in uh, 1975. I was one of the uh, three candidates for the presidency of URI. And I had the most wonderful husband, Arthur. He was so excited for me. He said, if you got it, 
I will either take a leave or retire early, and I'll take over everything at home, and you can devote your energy to that. He was very, very supportive, which I thought was great. And I lost uh, by one vote, and it was a vote from Al Carlotti. And his reason for voting against me was, and I quote, no one can control that damn woman. <laughs> and that's why I wasn't president of URI. And he was probably right, OK? Uh, <laughs> now, in, uh, uh, several years ago, the phone rang. And this voice said, is this doctor duty? And I said, uh, yes, why? He said, well, this is an old friend of yours. And I'm in Newport, and I thought maybe I could visit. And I said, really, uh, who is this old friend? <laughs> and he said, it's Ellis, the man I was engaged to at Penn State in 1954. And he came over and visited. And when he walked in, I thought, wow, I'd forgotten how good looking he was and how much fun we had. And so we had a nice visit. Oh, and he, he wanted to take me out to dinner. I said, well, I'm busy. He said, you're always busy. I Just give me an hour. So we visited. And then uh, he was working uh, Woods Hole on the Noor. And he ran the um, computers. He drove the ship, really. Uh, and so he was out to sea for four months, and he came home for two. And he called me from Yokohama. He said, I just found out I'm going to be home for Christmas. Um, how about spending Christmas together? I said, well, sure, join me. I, you know, I'll be with my family. He said, no, I don't want to meet all your relatives. So he came on the 26th of December. And on the 28th of December, we decided to get married. And so that was, that was it. And uh, our wedding was a lot of fun. We both agreed that since we'd been married, before that we'd have a small wedding in the living room of our home. And he was, again, on the ship. And he was in a port in uh, Scotland. And I had sent him a wedding invitation. And he goes, it's beautiful. But what? He said, we talked about 20 people. Um, why this fancy invitation for 20 people? I said, well, um, I've added a few more friends. <laughs> um, how many? I said, uh, I sent out 140 invitations. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a wonderful wedding. We had a big tent in the yard. And we had just lots of fun. And, and everyone, and, and he enjoyed it once he got used to it. And uh, we left the wedding. No one, including our children, knew. A friend of mine was a helicopter pilot, so he swooped in and picked us up and took us down to Shelter Harbor Inn, and so that was it. So that was a, a wonderful thing. So these are, when you think about it, it's amazing to see how the role of women has changed in, you know, in my lifetime. Of course, I'm pretty old, so that doesn't mean it was fast. But for the young women here in the uh, audience, you know, you think of, of what it was really like. It was just very difficult. And uh, it was definitely tremendous discrimination. And I'm starting to do some writing now. And it, it uh, creates some <laughs> introspection on my part. And my late husband, Arthur, used to say, he said, you're the least introspective person I've ever known. You just barrel in and things happen. And so I think, where did this protest business come from? What, you know, what program made a stick up for these things? And then I remembered, I was nine years old, and I, we lived on a big farm, and I raised animals outside. I was outside with my dad a lot. And I wanted to join the 4-H club where they had animals. But only boys could join that club. Girls had to join home ec. And I said, that's not fair. And he said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, I want to I speak up about it. I, I, I want to protest. He said, good. I'll take you to New Haven. The man you want to see is Warren Brockett. He works for the Farm Bureau. And you have to go in and tell him why it's unfair. And I said, well, it just is. He said, well, that's not enough. So we worked together on why it was unfair. 
And he drove me in and opened the door and said, good luck. I said, why aren't you coming with me? He said, no, no, you're on your own. Stick to your guns, kid. You've got a good argument. So we integrated the 4-H club. And that's where it all came from, which is just really amazing how things have happened. And so I don't know. I, I just sit back now and I mean, where there's still women still have problems. We see there's still, you know, discrimination. But, you know, you dig in and we're still making progress. Uh, it's fascinating that there are two possible women candidates for the presidency uh, in the next run. Um, and I think that the, and I think we have wonderful role models for our young women in college now. They you know, you really do anything that you really care to do. It's, it is really not much standing in your way. Uh, unfortunately, not enough women, based on necessity, but also my personal feeling, don't go into the technical uh, engineering, those kind of uh, fields. There's a tremendous need for techies now, and the salaries are good. So I think that uh, it has. Um, at one time, probably the only jobs, I'm thinking of my mother, that women, could, you could be a nurse or you could be a teacher. You know, there weren't many uh, possibilities at all. Uh, my mother is a pretty great gal. Um, she was a teacher, but she was a, had an independent streak in her. In 1926, with a gal she taught school with and with my then 60-year-old aunt, she drove to Yellowstone Park in a Model T Ford, and I thought that was pretty sassy. Steve? Agnes, do you remember the story about the president who tried to deny you a raise? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> One, uh, I married Arthur in December of 1962. And in 1963, I got my, they call it the letter of intent. This is before you had uh, contracts. And frankly, every year I had received a merit raise, a little extra. There was nothing there. So I went to the department chair. He recommended me. The dean recommended me. So it was Dr. Horn who recommended me who denied it. So I made an appointment to see him. He said, you don't need it now. You're married. <laughs> so you're saying my marriage is standing in way of my professional and financial development. Well, that's one way to put it. But you don't need it. You're married. So that's standing in the way. Look, Dr. Horn, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down to the town hall this afternoon and get a hold of Foster Sheldon, who is a town clerk. I'm going to start the annulment proceedings on my marriage. And then I'm going to live with Arthur as a common law wife, which, of course, you couldn't do in those days. And then I'm going to take out a full page ad in the Narragansett Times to let the community know why I'm divorcing Arthur. <laughs> he was furious. God damn it, you wouldn't. I said, are you kidding? And I get, out, I get out the door, and I was about 10 feet down the car, and I said, come back here. You would. And that's how I got my raise. Of marriage. It was $140. You know, that wasn't much, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was, thank you for reminding me. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have, I, do they still have the honors colloquium? Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. I did one in 1980 on coming to grips with a, glo a global village. And uh, that was a, a lot of protests going on. And then and a gal that uh, was my roommate down at Penn State was frankly as black as I am blonde. I mean, really. They used to have a black and white scotch. I don't, they don't have that anymore. Do they, Steve? Do you know scotch? Oh, anyone? We have a scotch drinker here? Black and white. Anyhow, she used to say, hey, duty, we should model for black and white scotch, because we had a lot of fun. And I met her in a restaurant at Penn State. She couldn't get any housing. And, you know, stupid me. I, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around the fact that she was being discriminated against. We couldn't get any housing. So I went to see the university president. And each time I got, of course, they didn't put up with students then. I said, He's busy. Like, Sorry, the president's busy. So, so in December, I went back. I said, uh, well, he's busy. I said, oh, I know he's busy. He's always busy. But see, classes are over, so I can wait. 
and I pulled out my knitting, and I had size 12 wooden knitting needles, you know, this big, <laughs> clack, 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 clack. And finally, she went in and she said, I don't know who she is, but she's not leaving. She's driving me crazy. <laughs> and I heard the president say, well, no more than 20 minutes. And I went in and I said, thank you very much, uh, sir. I don't need 20 minutes. Four will do. I said, I have this marvelous uh, uh, friend. She can't get housing here in State College because she's, and we use the word Negro in those days. I said, if you take their money for tuition, don't you have an obligation to house them? And he said, well, that's really an issue for the real estate people in town. And we had a few tight words. And I said, well, look, um, I'm so upset about this that I'm going to take out an ad in the, Nar in the uh, Center Daily Times. That's a, good, you know, that's a good threat, because I would have done it about uh, segregation on campus. And I said, and um, your brother's going to be very unhappy about this. His brother was Dwight D. Eisenhower, and this was Milton Eisenhower, Ike's brother. <laughs> and I said, I'm sure he won't want this to happen. So that's how they got started at Penn State and making sure that the Negroes had rooms. You know, it just, it's, you know, just, and I, I have to thank my father over and over again for programming me. But anyhow, the honors colloquium, which is why I have a mouth on Mickey, uh, the kids were sort of against uh, the military, but I wanted someone from you know military to speak to the groups of, about what military was all about. And Mickey was had been an officer, was at that time an officer in the United States Army. She retired at the rank of captain, as a matter of fact. And uh, they were going to protest, and they weren't going to come to class because they didn't want to hear from any one out of the Pentagon, any man was going to prop you know use propaganda and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, if you miss the class, you funk the course. It's not the way. I said, if you're unhappy, you protest here in front of someone, not run away and hide. Well, Mickey was gorgeous. And she always had her uniforms tailor-made. And when Mickey swept into that classroom, because I said, you Mickey Cash, they had no idea that it was a woman. When she strode into that classroom, they went, <laughs> Couldn't believe it. And she did a terrific job, and it was really funny. And can you just see how these prejudices creep in when they don't even know what they're talking about? And so Mickey was. And then another thing I want to talk about, speaking about prejudice, I had a friend named Winnie Brownell who was up for promotion for full professor. And that year, there were four colleagues from the uh, College of Arts and Science that were up for promotion two men and two women. Winnie was one and Lois Cuddy was the other. I'm sorry. Okay, for, the, for, the, for the full professor. Yeah. And I went to Winnie and said, uh, you know, we can't uh, let this happen. And she wasn't sure what to do. And I said, well, I just hope you'll let me uh, represent you because this is outrageous. We had a lot, I had a lot of fun. We had a, I challenged the Vice President for Academic Affairs. What was his name, just uh, Gitlitz. Gitlitz. David Gitlitz, yeah. <laughs> and he was relatively new and he said, who is this Agnes Duty who thinks she can debate me and everyone started to laugh. <laughs> well, it was hilarious. We got on, and he read his statement. It was awful. And I started out, and I said, you know what bothers me? This new school of lentils that we have, first, they count how many classes you teach. Then we have split P's. They split that and say, OK, how many articles have you written? They went through the whole school of legumes, and, uh, legumes labeling each one. So I had eight bags of beans with me. I said, now, if you agree that the president needs to pay attention to individuals and not bean counting, and I threw these out, I want you to mail one bean a day in an envelope to the president as a sign of protest 
for Winnie Brownell and the other two. We jammed up the mail groups, <laughs> and the kids just loved it. And, uh, they reviewed Winnie's uh, criteria for promotion, and it was amazing. She got it. And uh, so she said, let's have a victory party. I said, no, no, it's over. Let's have a promotion party. And I had it at my house. And we, of course, we invited many people. And then Winnie asked if she could bring the champagne. I said, sure. So she went to a uh, liquor store up in, was it North Kingstown, East Greenwich, and smiling, giggling, and she wanted what, two or three cases of champagne. And the man said, oh, you know, wedding? She said, no. Uh, graduation? No. Uh, anniversary? No. He said, well, what is it? She said, well, after some difficulties, I've just been promoted to a full professor at URI. Are you that lady they were so mean to? I read about it in the newspaper. <laughs> God bless you. You can have the champagne at cost. <laughs> so when he got promoted and we had champagne at cost. <laughs> So what kinds of questions do any of you have or some of you have about the careers of women or personal career? Any? Yes. What was your experience as one of the very few uh, female debate coaches on the, the national and local uh, I had a very positive experience. And I'm going to have to give my father some credit. You know, I grew up on a farm. I was outside, you know, and uh, did a lot of things. And um, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I was, uh, sometimes I was the only woman there. And we'd go out and party and, and uh, drink. And sometimes, should I tell the West Point story? Long, yes. It's a long story. You should tell it. <laughs> um, it's the stuff of legend. <laughs> Uh, I was out with the boys, and again, they, they were wonderful. They treated me nicely and with respect, and we had a good time. So we were at the uh, Oak Club on uh, West Point, and we drove to Hotel Fair, which is the military hotel on West Point, and there was only w one parking space left, and there was a sign reserved for Omar Bradley. So I said to Herb James, the debate coach from Dartmouth, stop the car. I'll get rid of that sign. So I took the sign and I threw it over the wall. And I felt this hand on my shoulder. What did I just see you do? I said, I put a sign over the wall. I said, you're destroying military property. He said, no, I'm not. I just re replaced it and moved it to another space. He said, no. I said, well, look, you stand right here. I'll go over the stone wall. I'll get the sign and bring it back. He said, no, you won't. No, you won't. Next thing I know, and my buddies, debate coaches, in come the military police. <laughs> One on each arm, off to the, uh, the, the dungeon, went down steps in there with name, gave my name, and I was really scared. And uh, height, I gave him that. Age, I said, that's an ungentlemanly question to ask. <laughs> How old are you? I said, several years over 21. And your weight? I said, my God. <laughs> he said, lady, how much do you weigh? I said, 121 pounds soaking wet, which is another lie. Okay. <laughs> so then I really got scared. This, they were booking me. I was going to be arrested. And I said, you know, I try to be friendly. But I think you should know that my father has been very active in the democratic politics in Connecticut. And he has a very good friend who's an attorney, and he's in Washington right now. Um, he's the Attorney General of the United States. His name is Robert Kennedy. So if you give me the phone, I'd like to call him. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> 
well, we just, you know, we just were a little hasty here, and oh, they treated me nicely, and they escorted me back to the hotel, and, and uh, my buddies were all down in the lobby, the debate coaches, male coaches. Agnes is in trouble. I got everyone up. Though. Who do you know? Who do you know? Who do you know? And I came in. I said, Yoo-hoo, I'm back. And we all laughed, and we thought that was the end of it. The next night, at the debate banquet, this young cadet, about Adam's height, full military dress, came to the hotel there to escort me to the banquet. And he said, now, I know there was some trouble, but please, he said, I'm a senior, and I want to graduate, so please, please stop causing <laughs> I said, oh, I wouldn't consider causing any trouble. I got there. General Westmoreland was the commandant at West Point. And he had me sit at the head table next to him. And he hoped everything was fine. And uh, I didn't need to call anyone. I said, oh, no, you've all been wonderful. And those debate coaches, we couldn't look one another in the face because they all knew. And that's when I'm awfully glad that I read Hitler's Mein Kampf, because he talked about the effect of the big lie. I don't tell them very often, but that was one that worked. <laughs> uh, I guess that word got out, Steve, on the debate circuit. <laughs> this story has been confirmed by When I came here, the debate group was called the Little Rest Debating Society. And I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> Little Rest is something you're never going to find. So it became the URI Forensic Club. And I had the kids. And, and by the way, when I first came here, one of the first debates we had against Yale, they lost. And they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have. And I got a little hot on the guy. I said, what's the matter with you, nitwits? Why'd you lose? I said, well, Dr. Duty was Yale. I said, I know it's Yale. I can read. Now, what's your problem? It was an Ivy League complex. And I said, hey, wait a minute. We're as good as anyone you're going to meet with the possibility of Dartmouth, Herb James's team. And it, that was one of the problems I had, you know, getting them over that. So I took them to good hotels. And then Dr. Horn got a look at the expense account. And he called me and he said, I stay at the Y when I travel. And I said, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had some words of um, conflict, you might say. And I said, listen, these kids need to know they're good. I'm not going to put them up in the Y. They're going to think they're peasants. I don't want that attitude. I said, we're as good as anyone who walks into any debate tournament, and that's where we're staying, or you get a new debate coach. So we stayed where we wanted to. You know, not, we didn't stay at the plaza, but you know, we didn't stay at the Y either. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are the adventures I had. Thank you, Dr. <laughs>